Hey guys, this is Zigman and Zach Takis, and when you finish it up listening to this great podcast, make sure you head on over and check out Shotgun Wrestling Radio. That's right, we're new to the EMT Podcast Network. Over at Shotgun Wrestling Radio, we give you the latest news in professional wrestling. That's right, we cover WWE, Ring of Honor, Impact Wrestling, and more. Want to know what's going on in the events in the Iowa Independent Seeds? We cover that too with our Pro Wrestling Calendar. That's right, Zig Man. Not only do we cover that, but we also have a wide variety of interviews with pro wrestlers, both past and present. All our interviews can be found on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Shotgun Radio and the number one. We hope you'll take the time to give us a listen and remember to give us a like and follow on Twitter and Facebook at Shotgun Radio and the number one. You're listening to the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. Yeah, it's a mouthful. For more great shows, visit electronicmediacollective.com. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for downloading this most recent episode of Movie Guys Podcast. You can check out other episodes at movieguyspodcast.podbean.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and a quick warning to everybody listening to Movie Guys Podcast. Each show is spoiler filled and also each episode is for mature audiences only. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I cannot uh, compare this movie to the book at all. I want to really bad because I have absolutely no interest to see this movie until I saw the movie. I'm Jordan. Thank you so much for checking out Movie Guys Podcast. I'm joined here, like always, with Eric and Ryan. Eric, how the hell are you doing, man? Now, did you know that this was a book? Yeah, You're a fan of it, of Stephen King, and I know, Ryan, that you are as well, too, but... A lot of people seem to not know that this was a sequel, and this was a late sequel. 2013 is when this book was written by Stephen King, right? So did you go into it already well read into the story and up to date about everything that happens? Or were you like me where you just didn't – I didn't even know the book existed, and then I I hear about this, and and well, here I am talking about the movie with you guys. Um, I know Ryan uh, probably knows about the book first, so I will let him talk in a second. But I knew of this book because of my brother. Um, He is a big uh, Stephen King fan. Uh, He told me, hey, man, uh, Stephen King's writing his first actual sequel. I was like, what is it? He goes, it's called Dr. Sleep. It's the uh, sequel to The Shining. And I went, what is it about? about and he said oh it's about danny and what happens after the overlook oh so he read it he told me about it it was not the sequel that i wanted nor was this the movie that i wanted ryan did you did you know about the book well i mean i was aware of the book i've i've read most of stephen king's books this is actually the shining uh and dr sleeper one of the, the few that i have not read um and the 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 book actually he had a poll he posted on his website where he had two book ideas that he'd come up with um, at roughly the same time. And he put it to his fans, which book did they want to have first? Which book did they want him to do? And it was um, a sequel to The Shining or a sequel to the Dark Tower series. And he the, the Dark Tower series won and he wrote The Wind Through the Keyhole, um, which is kind of, it's a weird book. Um, but then he didn't want to leave the story alone, so he wrote this one um, after the fact. Um, but I have not read the book. I am not, I wasn't familiar with anything going in and I'll be honest with you. Um, you guys, have you guys ever ridden or been to Universal Studios and been on the ET ride that they have there? Yes, I have not. Okay. So the ride is a sequel to ET. So at the, uh, at the ride, you are on these bikes and the, you're on this little trolley that's guided on a hook on the ceiling and you go through the ending of the movie where they, they escape from the police officers. They fly over the city and through the woods and everything. But then you continue on and you end up on E.T.'s homeworld. And it's just like this psychedelic mishmash of images and colors. And you're there to help 
rescue um, E.T.'s mentor, Botanicus, and it you get off the ride and you're thinking, like, you know, not bad, but not the way I thought they would take it. And that's pretty much my my view of, of the movie after I've seen it. Good movie. Did not see it coming. Yeah, you know, um, before we get into the actual movie itself... When I first heard that they were going to when I first heard that Stephen King was going to do a sequel to The Shining, I was disappointed because when my brother told me what the story was going to be about, I was disappointed because I wanted a prequel. Okay? So now this is the point of the conversation where we need to stop talking about the book and go into the actual movie of Stanley Kubrick's version which Stephen King hates, right guys? Like what I wanted to see is a prequel. Uh, Mr. Grady, the guy that, uh, the butler that Mr. Jack Torrance runs into, who was the previous caretaker. I want to see the Shining prequel about what happens to the Grady family more than I care about Danny. Because Danny, as a character in the first movie, was not at all interesting to me. At all. So, going into a two and a half hour film here that we're going to talk about, following the story of Danny, I could give two shits about. Real quick on that, then, because I think the reason why we got a sequel and why it follows Danny is because Danny has a power that literally the entire premise of the book and story is based off of. So if if considering that this power comes into play in a prequel, then where would it fall into the whole Mr. Grady thing? I mean, would you put it there at all, or are you just looking for a repeat of the Jack Torrance nightmare experience that is the Overlook Hotel? I think you do a little bit of both, Eric, because nobody... Okay, I can't say nobody, but general audiences don't know The Shining the book. They know the movie. They know the lore, the legacy, the mythology of the movie. So you, Mike Flanagan, who I really like the films that he has made, should have done something different and paid homage to that movie more. Regardless of what Stephen King feels, the movie is iconic. So you could we have got made... got a lot of fan service. I'm cutting you up. We got a lot of fan service in this movie. And I I could agree this movie is getting very mixed reviews, and I think it's because Stephen King took The Shining to the next level, to the supernatural supernatural kind of level. This isn't a horror. This is more of a dark fantasy now, where we have magic and superpowers involved in it. Ryan, what do you think about that? About Eric's comment or about your comment? Well, I guess you can do either both. Or. Yeah, either or. Well, I agree. I don't think this is much of a horror movie. I mean, it does have elements in it that could classify um, as horror, but I do agree that it's uh, more of a dark fantasy. Um, but this movie feels very much like a Stephen King story uh, when you compare the original Shining. The original Shining doesn't really feel a whole lot like Stephen King. Um, it feels more like Stanley Kubrick. And I think, I think on top of everything, it's... I understand it's a sequel to The Shining, but I, I feel that it's kind of unfair a little bit to compare the two. Um, not just because it, you know, uh, The Shining is directed by Stanley Kubrick, who's considered one of the greatest directors of, of any era, any country, um, but just they're not about the same things. The uh, this one is um, Doctor Sleep is about like your legacy and what you leave behind and all that. And The Shining is I don't know I'm not exactly sure what themes permeate the original Shining uh, outside of the uh, theme of isolation. Jordan, you said this is your favorite movie, so you might be able to talk more about that. But I don't know I just feel like comparing this movie directly to The Shining, even though it doesn't invite those comparisons because it does at the end dovetail into that story. Um, I don't know it just kind of does it a, dis a disservice. Well, see, going off to me, going off to what you said, Ryan, about how I've made comments that this is my favorite movie, The Shining. What I like about The Shining so much is that, regardless of the fact that Jack Nicholson's batshit crazy at the first frame of the movie, 
the whole point of the story is your average middle class American Joe dad who was a loving, caring father snaps and it breaks your heart seeing him chasing his family with an axe. And what drives a man to that point? Were there actually ghosts in that first Shining movie? Or was it all in Jack Nicholson's head? You don't know. So when we get into this movie, we find out more about The Shining, which which I was disappointed about because I don't want to know more about The Shining. Uh, I don't want to... I feel when they talk more about The Shining in this movie, about how you have these group of people, the true knot, uh, who is who is uh, who is ran by a woman named Rose, who wants to take the steam from people? It's it's just it's nonsense. It, it's it's it gets too fantastical in its creation, and it, that's it why I don't think this is a good idea. It certainly does, and as much of a eye roll as that may sound, as I'm watching this movie, at the same part, it's the story is well told. Every question that I may have is answered. There's nothing loose. Everything's tight as far as the the world building, the character building, everything else. In my opinion, I, I think it's just it made sense. I I was along for the ride, and it definitely helped that the movie paced very well, and the visuals were fantastic with this too. And I think that that worked out a, a lot too. I it was it was. I enjoyed it because they explained The Shining more than just this this supernatural thing that they have, as rare as it is, but also that um, everyone might have, or a lot of people have it, they just don't know it, right? It's exactly what Halloran said in the in the first one. Everybody has The Shining, a lot of people just don't know it, or they ignore it, right? Those those parts, you know, where you, uh, you know, you, you think about a song before it comes on the radio, right? Or... You, what do you say? Bring flowers home for your wife when she's feeling blue, and you, she didn't even ask her, or something like that. You know those little predictors. So I, I like that it's just exists in the world, kind of thing, because you could say it's kind of like the force. You know, these people are a little more more force sensitive. Yeah, but is it worth it? Is it necessary to tell us this? Because we going off of the Kubrick film, and we're not talking about the book. Going off the Kubrick film, we don't really know what The Shining is. So, you're making a sequel to the movie. You're not making a sequel to the book. That's what you should do as the filmmaker of this. And having it come full out and just show the monster, so to speak, of The Shining, I think kind of taints it, in a way. Well, maybe that's the issue. Maybe that's the issue at hand, because... It, it's called Dr. Sleep, so it it's based off of the book, whether you want it to be or not. But maybe that's the pull that it's feeling that has to be uh, has to show fidelity to both the original classic and to the original novel. So it's pulled in two separate ways. Because again, I'm not I've, I've not read the book, but it's very well known that Stephen King is not a fan of the movie, um, and he wrote and produced his own TV miniseries in the mid '90s, late '90s. Um, starring Steven Weber. I, I, where I think I've, I watched that with you, Ryan. I've never seen that. No, you have not I seen, that? seen that one. Steve Weber I've and heard uh, it. Rebecca De I think is in that. De Mornay, yeah, Rebecca De Mornay. Um, I just heard it's complete trash. Yeah. Um, can I can I take thirty seconds here to just to just tell you guys that since you guys have not seen it and I've seen that TV show, at the end of the series, Shining TV show, you guys will. I I can't wait for your reactions. So it jumps forward in time after the Overlook Hotel blows up. It jumps forward to Danny's graduation, high school graduation. He is graduating cap and gown. When he gets his diploma, the camera stays on him. He starts to smile. It does a reverse shot of Ghost Jack floating Casper style in the air blows Danny a kiss. Danny reaches out and grabs it and holds it to his cheek. End of show. How does the audience react? The audience sees all this? No, nobody sees. It's just in his mind kind of thing. No, but like the audience sees um, sees Danny just stop on stage, smile, and like yeah. grab something out of the air and hold it to his face? That's what you see in the movie, yes. Oh, sweet. Yes. I kind of want to watch it. Oh, it's, 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 it's terrible. It's four hours. 
It's four hours. But anyway. Oh, yeah, bad thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost worse as Pinocchio's Revenge. Right. Eric, you have... Eric, are we going to have a drinking game of that, by the way? Because for four years of Movie Guys Podcast, you bring that up at least once a year. Are we going to have to review and or do a drinking game every time you bring that up? Pinocchio's Revenge? Yes, that's like the... Th- yeah. Yeah, because you bring it up once a year. You, okay. You, you would love it. Oh, no, I have seen it. That's right. I have I have seen Pinocchio's Revenge. So in the Doctor Sleep book, the Overlook Hotel is not existent, and Danny Torrance survives at the end of the book. Everything that you see at the end of this climax of this movie does not happen in the book. This is all Mike Flanagan. Danny Torrance in the book goes to the site where the Overlook was. Some shenanigans happens. And he ultimately survives. And uh, what's the girl's name that has the shine? Ada? Ada, right? Yeah. Abra. 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 Uh, him and her go off and, you know, are, are, are just having a gay old time. This movie completely different. And that's what Mike Flanagan should have done right off the bat. Now, I'm not saying this movie's bad at all. I'm not saying this is a terrible movie. I'm just saying this is what makes you smile. If you are a fan of The Shining, you're going to be bored for two hours and you're going to be <laughs> on the edge of your seat excited for the last 30 minutes. I mean, that's that's what this is. Because the first two hours is character buildup and development, which I'm not saying is bad, but it's like, you know, this this movie is the definition of a roller coaster. The whole two hours, you're going up that hill. Is this hill going to turn? What's going on? And then when you get to the overlook, it goes down. And you're having a great time. It was you some, amazing. Uh, some pretty great scenes in in this movie. Um, the one I wanted to talk to you guys about that I actually think I, I tried to hold off on was the uh, kill scene for the kid who was in, who was, who was that, Tremblay? Or, who was, the kid was in Good... Uh, good boys there was a kill scene in this movie that was uncomfortable as shit holy cow um there's a little fact on imdb that says that uh, on the take of that uh he just just went off kind of like that with uh, with acting like that and um who was the who played the uh the the main chick the main rebecca villain? ferguson yeah that she just froze and and then couldn't do any of her lines and I mean, I don't know. I, was that were you guys able to take that scene better than I could? I guess. Yeah, because the kids. Oh, told oh yeah, that's right. Because you have kids. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm numb to violence at this point, so it, blood is blood. Blood is blood. I'll tell you though, one one of the things I always like in movies, uh, especially when they do it near the beginning, if they are willing to kill children, especially young children like infants or toddlers. I am almost immediately hooked into the movie. And it's not just because... I think I talked about it last week or maybe a week before. Yeah, last week we talked about Dark Fate. It's not just because I like seeing kids die. I'm not implying that at all. Um, I just When a movie is willing to kill a child and let you know that child is dead, it just gives a sense of anything can happen. Like There's no safe there's no safety for any of the characters. And I like it the like cuz at the beginning when he's he he um when Danny wakes up from his drunken stupor next to the woman who vomited and then he just picks up the baby, puts the baby next to her before he leaves and you find out they like the lady died, she choked on her vomit. Yeah. And the baby the baby just died of starvation, like a slow agonizing death that Danny caused. Uh you know, got me hooked. So that means that you're a fan of Alien versus Predator Requiem, then, because they kill a kid with a face auger in the beginning of that movie. I have never seen that one, but I might watch it now. Yes, kid gets killed with a face auger. All right, then. Hey, kill kids, I'm, I'm in. Yeah, why not? But, okay, so I was really geeked, though, when we got to the Overlook. Because knowing what I know of the book, I did not know we were going to go to the Overlook. I was ecstatic. Like, the, the fanboy of me was coming out on this. Did, were, were you guys at Austin in the theater going, yes, finally, something that I know and I, I'm f- familiar with, Eric? Oh, I was I was giddy as soon as I heard the, the music. Uh, that theme is undeniably just iconic and creepy. I love it, those, that, was it like a trombone? Yeah, the brr, brr, yeah. Brr, yeah. 
And uh, I like how in, in this one they start off with the same helicopter shot over the lake, over the island, at, but at night this time. Um, whereas in the beginning of the first movie, it was during the day in the morning as Jack Torrance is driving up to the Overlook Hotel. But I like it. It's, it's great. I like that the hotel is its own character. It, I guess this Mike Flanagan guy is going to ki- typecast himself into haunted houses. I mean, which is fine, right? Because what has he done with haunted houses so far that has been parable? I can't tell you one thing that he's done with haunted houses that's been terrible. He he made the sequel to what? Uh, the Ouija board? And that was better than the first one because nobody cared. <laughs> nobody cared about that first movie. And then he comes out of nowhere with the sequel and everybody's like, oh, this is actually good. I mean, he made a, that's fine. He made a movie, uh, o- Oculus? I think well, it was he, Oculus. Yeah, he did Oculus. About a haunted mirror? Yeah. This guy is going to do good. This guy could be the Steven Spielberg to Haunted Houses, and that's fine. I would rather take him than James Wan's Conjuring franchise any day. We uh, we are in, the, in the, the market for a new James Wan type. Somebody better than James Wan. Okay, like, like one of the things I want to praise about this movie is that we do get some jump scares, right? But I feel like those jump scares are earned. And I'm going to tell you guys what my definition of a jump scare is, and maybe you guys can agree or disagree. Uh, But the common aspect of a jump scare is that out of nowhere, a loud noise happens in the theater and something pops out just to make you jump, right? Yeah. Yep. So that happens only a few times in this movie. This movie's more of a psychological horror, which I like what Flanagan is doing. I feel that this movie is going to become not as popular or or, um, as iconic as the first Shining movie. But this movie is performing almost the same exact way as the first one did. It's not doing great in the box office. It's getting mixed reviews. And then, boom, eventually down the road, people are going to start looking at this and going, you know what, this is actually a work of art. This is great. I'm not saying this movie deserves like a large bag of popcorn. I'm just saying that this movie, overall, it it gives you everything that you need if you are a Shining fan. I think the, I guess to get back what we were talking about, I actually think when they go to the Overlook Hotel, that that is that's the weakest part of the movie. I think really and yeah, because I, I I don't think like I you can you can say for the theme for Danny's character it's necessary, but I don't think for the story overall it's absolutely necessary that they have to end at the um, Overlook Hotel. It's cool. It is it's it's a cool concept, and what they're able to do with it is is like I'm on board, but I think it like I think it's some of the weakest parts of the movie. How? I just don't, like I said, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it adds a whole lot to the grander story that they're trying to tell. Cause he's, if for Danny, it makes sense. Cause he's unleashing his demons to defeat this woman. And it's supposed to help him get past whatever, you know, it's cause he locked him away. He didn't defeat the demons. They're just, they're just being held in check. Uh, and like, that's expressed through the booze and he, he goes to AA and all this stuff. But for actual Abra story to defeat the villain, it's not absolutely necessary that they go to the Overlook. So like it felt like it was forced to me. I mean, I, well, mean, I, I just I, I I agree because suddenly these demons are released or the spirits, whatever you want to call them, are released and they are going for this steam which is now introduced into this world. Whereas before, like they hit Danny in the hotel. Why wouldn't they capitalize on that and take the steam then? I know it didn't exist and everything back then, but I, I feel that this was a little bit more of a, a, a kind of a, just a wrap it up type of thing. Um, I like that they brought the hotel into here. I agree that they probably didn't need to add it into this. It just seemed kind of unnecessary. But when you're throwing fan service this hard, you're probably going to have to put it uh, put it there. Um I like that it burnt down. That's that's fine too. I don't know what else I would have it. Maybe that I I don't know that she is just stuck in in the hotel for something or. Well, my thought was like what I thought it was going to build up to. Like I knew they were going to go to the Overlook, 
Um, but as I, because the uh, trailers, um, but like as I'm watching the movie, I thought for sure that it was going to end in some sort of mind battle, which is kind of, you, you kind of get a little bit of that near the end when he tries to lay the trap to lock her away. Right. Um, which is another, another thing I thought was kind of funny twice in the like near in the latter half of the movie you have these two plans that like that don't work and then like they have backups but then like they seems like they knew the backup was going to work better than the first one so why would you just why would you not just go with the backup plan like when they when the uh when the gypsies go to kid to go to get abra and she's been she's projecting into the woods um and then all of a sudden the guy just goes to her house kills her dad and, and shoots her with the whatever whatever drug that is and then they try to trap her in the overlook inside um inside danny's mind but then he just ends up releasing the demons and the both of those second outcomes seem like the person who was who did them was more confident they were going to work than the first ones so i don't know it just feels like why not just go with the second one well, because because the woman from 237 is still haunting him from when he was a kid from the original movie she plays a she plays a bigger role in this than what I thought she would. But my question is, my question is, why not? Because that seemed to be like when it, the way it was presented, the way I I processed it watching the movie is that when Danny goes to release the demons, he's uh, she asks him uh, what's in there or something like that. And I, well, I can't remember exactly what she says, but he ends up saying they're starving and then he just lets them out. So like you have that fun one liner, then he releases them. So it makes it think like, it makes me think that, Oh, he's, he was planning this anyways. So was that, was the trap just a distraction of a distraction to get to this point? I mean, I don't know. I mean, they did that, how they did, did that he twice know in the movie. that they wanted the steam? Like what indicator did he have that they wanted the steam in like, in that that's what, do you, you know like this this should have been all new and i i just don't understand I just, that part i was my only gripe i guess about this movie is that he, he, i wanted a little bit more from that well more okay. explanation well how about this as a as a as a final explanation what i took from the original shining going with this Go with me on this, guys. This isn't a fan theory. This is just what I take, right? So, in the original Shining movie, there is no ghouls or ghosts, right? But every time that we see a ghost, we see Danny first talking to Tony, or he does that spastic freak-out thing, right? Red rum, red rum. When his shining is activated, that's when the hotel starts to unleash these ghosts, right? So the sure. reason why that the, the reason why he comes back to the overlook at the end of this movie, right, is because the hotel possessed or somehow controlled Jack Torrance's dad to kill Danny and Wendy, so the hotel could engulf Danny into the Shining to become more powerful. That's what I think the main goal is. I think the hotel is in search for a soul that has the Shining. That's what I think it is. And why does it not try to kill Dick? Because he has the Shine. Yeah, yep. which 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 kind of sucks because in the movie, which this is a sequel to, Dick dies. But in the original book, Dick doesn't die. So it's like, again, I think Mike Flanagan is making two different movies here. I think he's trying to respect Stephen King. I think what happened was, I think that he was like, hey, Stephen, look, dude, we got to make Dr. Sleep. I'm going to pay homage to your shit, but, you know, I know you're like Kubrick, but we got to do something with Kubrick here. And Stephen King's like, all right, suck my dick and let's go on. I mean, I'm being honest. I mean, that's what I think it is because because you look at the first two hours of this movie, it's completely different than the last half an hour of this movie. It's like it's like Mike Flanagan, the last 30 minutes of this movie, was remaking The Shining. And he did a damn good job at it. So that's where my two cents come into that, Ryan. I was just asking because your explanation, you said like the, you, th you think the hotel is trying to absorb Danny's shine to become more powerful. But my question was, why, they have, why haven't they done that with Dick Hollering yet? Because he also has the shine. I know, which, 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 which was my answer of this uh, sucks in a way. the daytime. <laughs> the There's daytime. people in there. He, he was, he was uh -huh. there during the season. 
It just sucks. Okay. You know, because because Dick should not be alive in this universe. The, the hotel only haunts in the off season. Doesn't hotel doesn't haunt during the on season. Right? Because think about that. Before we close out for apocryphs here, if this is the sequel to the movie, Wendy and Danny leave, not Dick. Dick's dead. He got an axe in the chest. So why is Dick in this movie? He's he's, he's a spirit guy. He's a ghost. He's exactly. Man. Yeah, he's a ghost. He's shining in. He's he's what Danny is to Oliver at the end of the movie. Dick is to to Danny in this movie. All right. It's not like he's not, not. It's not like he's a visitor who comes to him at random moments. He's he's a ghost. He's a he's a figment of Danny's shine. I get that, but he should. All right. <laughs> That's fine. All right, you you're, you're just saying you're, you I, what I understood the question to be is you said he died. So why is he in this movie? He he did die. He's dead. He's not alive in this movie. He's dead. just a he's just a, a spirit guide. Well, I know, but 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 he shouldn't be a spirit guide. He should not exist in this movie, because because again, if you're gonna follow the original movie, there is no ghost. It's there is no American Horror Story TV show here where you kill somebody and they come back as a ghost and they stay in that area or they are your spirit guide. It, it it no, so it just. It doesn't make sense to me to have Dick in this movie. It just doesn't. I make think sense. it's just a further explanation of what the shine is. But do you want it? And the first, I mean, it's I don't I don't think this I don't think a sequel to The Shining is necessary. I know, but do you um, want if, an explanation to The Shine, or do you want it to be a mystery again? I, either or is fine. I think the explanation they give is perfectly suitable. I think for the story and, and what they're trying to portray, I think having this explanation for the shine works just as well as if they hadn't explained it. Because, I mean, ultimately, the the abilities of the shine grow and get deeper in the story, too. So, like, yeah, the explanation that it it's something people don't really understand or know that they have. It's, some people could confuse it as intuition or... Uh, um, the ability luck. to guess correctly, yeah, luck, things like that. It, it, it's the same as you know if, if they hadn't explained it. So Domino from Deadpool Two has the shine. Holy shit! Boom. Is this a Marvel movie? There Boom. That just happened. On that note, let's get into our popcorn ratings here for Doctor Sleep. Eric, what will be your popcorn rating for Doctor Sleep? I enjoyed this movie. I. I enjoyed it a lot. I had a good time in the theater. I don't know if I'll watch this movie again soon. Maybe I will. It depends if someone else is in the mood. I don't know if I will do it on my own. But listen, I I enjoyed the movie. I didn't know it was two and a half hours. It definitely felt that. Um, but I turned it all the same. I think I'll give it a, a large bag. We didn't talk about a scene where Abra uh, set a trap for Rose. Mm-hmm. As Rose first flew, had this beautiful scene where she was flying uh, above the uh, the earth and trying to scout for this this whale, as she was calling it, a white whale and kind of a thing, a big load of steam, which is played by Abra, this this gifted child, and she floats down into the the street, into this into her house, into the room, does this really cool uh, kind of turn type of thing, is really cool, and then she plants that trap. And flips it on her, and that was really cool. That was a really cool scene. There's just a lot of cool scenes in this movie. I, I enjoyed it. Um, it's a cool story. It's a large bag. I, I had a good time. Wow. Okay. I was not thinking that. I'm surprised, Eric. Oh, Ryan. I have some, I have some questions, but I, listen, I had a good time. Well, that's good, right? Because that's all. I mean, as long as you had a good time and it was told a good story, that's perfect. Ryan, how about you? What is your popcorn rating for Doctor Sleep? This is a medium bag for me. It's very close, very close to getting a large bag. Um, but there are some things I don't like about the movie, so I can't uh, quite pull myself to give it the large bag. I I do think it's too long. Two and a half hours is kind of long, especially for this this kind of story. Like the first one is fine. That's it's Kubrick. You know, I, I tend to not question his his decisions. This one, I don't think it's absolutely necessary to be two and a half hours long. I think they could have very easily cut out the bits with the girl who has like the mind control powers, um, like her backstory and how she becomes part of the group. If she's just already part of the group, that's not going to change anything. 
with the overall story. Good so like, you could have lost the whole thing in the beginning at the movie theater, her changing over and joining the group, and you would like the movie. I think would have moved, would have felt like it moved faster, even though it's only roughly like seven or eight minutes shorter. Um, like I said, I think the the ending is kind of weak. The final boss battle is kind of. Uh, not so great. I don't think I was expecting something more epic, especially since they have, since these characters are, uh, uh, have these incredible mind powers, uh, that it just ends like I get, it's, you know, it's pretty cool. It's like a nice little twist where he, he's been locking these demons away and then he unleashes them to save the day. But I was hoping for some big, like inception esque mind battle. Um, but love, like I forgot how much I enjoyed watching Ewan McGregor act in movies. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen him like as the lead in something, and he's just wonderful in this movie. I think um, the Danny character is not... I w- like Coming out of The Shining, watching that Danny, coming into this movie, this Danny, it's they're completely different. Like The first one is just a kid. He doesn't have a whole lot going on. Um, but they really... I was really surprised by how much depth they actually afforded um, Danny and Rose the Hat um, cause I, I really like when her family is dying, I actually was like, I was a little bit sad for her. Cause that's, that's what she lives for in a sense is she lives for her family. Uh, and yeah, uh, I happy this movie exists. I didn't think I would feel that way going in, but wholeheartedly recommend this movie. Um, Dr. Sleep is a medium bag for me. I'm on kind of the same realm as Eric here. It's, it's good for what it is. It's almost a large, not quite yet. Like a medium, you know, with, uh, with a little bit of popcorn on it, right? Um, I don't think if you are a big Shining fan as, as, as I am, so I'm speaking to you, this is not the movie that you're going to be excited for. This is not the sequel that you wanted. I'm sure a lot of Shining fans probably want to see us uh I'll probably want to see a prequel about the Grady family another family in the hotel but modernized to be super uber scary I think that's the movie that we wanted and to have that movie end with Jack Torrance showing up for his interview I think that would have made everybody happy um I can't believe room 237 is still a thing I can't believe that just rolled over into this um but I I did enjoy it. I'm happy that I saw it. And, you know, it's a tradition in my household to watch The Shining in December. So I, I'm looking forward to having The Shining being followed up to Dr. Sleep every December. So, yeah, medium bag for me. Not too bad. Next week, everybody who is listening will be coming back with something different than Dr. Sleep, a movie that has a lot of controversy within the behind the scenes of Movie Guys verse here. We're going to be reviewing Charlie's Angels. We're ex- I'm actually excited to talk about this. I'm Hell yeah. Ryan's excited. Eric, I think, has a gun to his head. Mm. This could be interesting. You don't want to miss next week's Charlie's Angels. So thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this episode of Movie Guys Podcast. And we'll be back next week for Charlie's Angels. So have a good night.